This is Capital Games Movie Club. I am the Wiz. And I'm Zero. Zero. How are you doing this week, my man? A little exhausted. Unfortunately, just dealing with a flea problem that has now affected our indoor-only cat. So oh, um, being bitten up and also being drugged up on Benadryl has been my life for the last couple days. Oh, God. Whew, that's terrible. Poor kitty. God damn. Poor you. My God. At least you're high as a kite while we're talking. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what better way for you to be high as a kite talking about the, the 2004 film Howl's Moving Castle directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Zero. I mean, God, man. I mean, you're into anime. You're into Asian cinema. You have to be familiar with with Studio Ghibli, correct? Yeah, um, they kind of have the same beloved reputation that Disney has with Western audiences. Mm -hmm. So that's really the best equivalency I can make for anyone who, by some freak coincidence, is not familiar with Studio Ghibli's work. I think to a point, if you're an animation fan, you, you probably started getting into animation through Disney. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is at this point, whether computer animation or with hand-drawn animation. But then, when you want to get more diverse, you graduate to Studio Ghibli, in, in a sense. The first Studio Ghibli movie I saw was in 2001, and it was, of course, Spirited Away. It was the first Miyazaki film I saw, it was a the first Ghibli film I saw, and I was blown the fuck away when I watched this. The, the problem with me, uh, when it comes to films that get a lot of praise, and I think this happens with a lot of people in this, is that when you watch it, you have that hype expectation in your brain. Going, oh, I've heard this is amazing. It better work. It better, you know, and often it doesn't. It surpassed those expectations for me. It was an amazing experience. And it's something uh, animated wise. I don't think any animated movie has ever touched since. It is a fantastic movie. What is your favorite Ghibli film? Or if you want to just tone it to a specific director, what's your favorite Miyazaki film? is a good question because I'd have to think on it especially since there's he's got quite a lot of work oh yes he <laughs> does and from what I've seen there is one film that he's done that I'm not entirely a fan of but for the most part nothing but bangers for this guy like he's done nothing but excellent work even though i'm not a fan of uh, the, the one fan of the film i'm not a fan of is princess mononoke but even i can understand that there is a quality to it that other animated films just don't have uh, when it comes to what it's what they're doing in this but he's got some shorts but but even like with his feature films they're fantastic they're uh, uh, the wind rises is a really good one what else um uh, of course yeah i think Princess Mononoke is probably by far my favorite. But, oh, okay. Um, that was right around the time it had just came out and everything, and anime was still kind of like a niche thing, especially since I would gotten into just anime stuff around 96. Oh, okay. And this one came out in 97, and I remember just hanging out with some of the fans of groups that traded VHS tapes to date how old I am. Oh, wow. <laughs> So um, I ran, I ran with uh, a group of friends who would trade like fan sub tapes uh, amongst each other and everything. And I remember just uh, when a slot had came open for a Princess Mononoke, I was just like, I need it. I, I want to see this. I need it. And um, managed to get the slot um, to uh, pick up a copy of the tape from one of the folks in the fan subbing groups that I ran with locally. Just pop that thing in and it was just just fantastic work really mm. and uh, that was kind of my first exposure to um, Miyazaki-san's work and Mononoke became popular at a time where Japanese anime was starting to get some credibility in theaters in, around the 90s it started with Akira it got critical acclaim and it actually did decent in the box office but it was in mostly art house theaters and then after that if I got this correct and someone can uh can correct me if i'm wrong but the next one that got big in theaters in the u.s was ghost in the shell um, akira was the big one uh, yeah. that was kind of the one that just opened everyone's eyes to to oh my god we gotta look at what japan's doing holy crap it's just yeah. this is insane for animation because um back in back in the 90s animation had this kind of like um reputation for being just 
just for kids or extremely low quality, uh, paired with lowbrow humor, um, with stuff like portrayed on um, Adult Swim and things like that. So that was kind of the stigma that animated shows had for the longest time. And then, of course, Akira just comes out of nowhere, just kind of just delivering a shock to the system to people who'd only been um, most exposed to just Western animation. And then they see this and they're just like, oh, my God, um, animation can have adult themes. Animation can have compelling stories. This is completely just mind blowing stuff. And no. then it sort of took off from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Americans, when it came to uh, animated films, it, it was strictly kids. They were animated films that were adult oriented that happened in like the 60s and 70s. Uh, I'm thinking Fritz the Cat. I'm thinking American Pop, uh, Heavy Metal, things like that. But they were like odd niches. People think, like, oh yeah, they did that once, but animation is really just for kids. And then in the 90s, anime basically shot that back up and said, oh, no, 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 here you go. Here's something else. So then after uh, Ghost in the Shell, and I think Cowboy Bebop the movie came out as well around that time, it was Princess Mononoke that was the next one that got big in theaters, uh, in in a small sense, in art house theaters. And it wasn't until 2001 where, uh, with the help of John Laster from Pixar and from Disney, that a big budget was marketed and used to release Spirited Away, which would then go on to win Best Animated Picture at the Oscars that year. Uh, My opinion on that is if there wasn't an animated feature Oscar category that year, it would have gotten the Best Picture nomination. But uh, I digress on that one. Since then, a lot of people in the West have been gravitating towards Studio Ghibli films. We're not not only the ones that are made by Miyazaki, but there's another one out there called Grave of the Fireflies that has gotten a lot of notoriety as well for, well, well, <laughs> that that movie is fantastic, but it, it's not a happy film. <laughs> yeah, that one is is one that you need to bring a big old box of Kleenex, and we're not talking the regular box of Kleenex. We're talking like the king size, family size version of that. Uh, tissue yeah. box. I only know this because um, I was in a literary appreciation class, but the professor had wanted to focus mostly on anime because she had recently just kind of became enraptured with it and built an entire curriculum on anime. And she wanted to, um, one of the themes that she wanted us to explore was sadness. And that was the assignment that we oh all had to sit in class and watch. And she she had, she had warned us for like, I think three weeks in advance. Hey, make sure you buy the biggest box of Kleenex or buy two because this one is going to depress you. And then I remember the day, the day before we were going to watch it, she had given us the final warning. All right, final warning. Do not forget your tissue boxes. Bring those bring those bad boys in because this is going to be a very sobering movie. And oh god, I remember just seeing this this real buff football player type just in in the class and and he he was the one that had all the machismo and bravado about him. He was like, "Ah, eh, only sissies cry at this dumb anime bullshit." By the end of Grave of the Fireflies, he was a sobbing mess. Oh, God. What, what that movie did specifically it, in the first five minutes was like oh, really set up what you're going to deal with throughout the entire movie. So, But we're not talking about Grave of the Fireflies, so <laughs> let's not get into that right away. We don't want to depress everybody. But if you are interested in that movie, I, I would say definitely watch it. It's, a, it's an amazing movie. Just be prepared. All right, Zero, let's get into the review of Howl, Howl's Moving Castle, directed by Hayao Miyazaki. I just want to say off the rip right here, you know, to keep my my film nerd and f- film snob cred, when people ask me, hey, Wiz, what's your favorite Japanese director? You know, as you do, you know, with all film snobs, they, ha- they have to ask you that. It's just part of the, the membership. And honestly, in order to keep my status in that group, I have to say, oh, you know, like Ozu or Kurosawa. I mean, who else could it be? Well, I've been lying. It's Miyazaki. I love Miyazaki films. He he makes excellent films, and even though they're animated, and that's not and that's not even fair to say, especially since they're animated, he adds an emotional punch to his movies 
that is really hard to replicate in live action. And which is why I love his features. Even the ones that I'm not, mm, I'm kind of in about. There's still a quality to it that is leagues above other animated and other films uh, in general. And I really liked Howl's Moving Castle. The thing that I gravitated towards in this movie that I really enjoyed is that uh, uh, it was one of the things I did not like about Princess Mononoke specifically. But uh, with this movie, it captures whimsy in a way that doesn't or it doesn't seem to talk down to a certain extent. Because when you have something that portrays whimsy, it, it seems to be like, oh, it, things just seem to happen because it's magical. And this movie doesn't do that. It still feels magical and fantastic and whimsical, and it's, it still has that feeling to it, but it still makes you feel like an adult watching it. It doesn't, it doesn't make me feel like I'm watching a Disney princess movie, specifically. And, and that's why I love the, the type of films that Miyazaki does, specifically what he did in this movie. This one had just a lot of fun about it, but much like you mentioned, it doesn't feel childish. It feels something that could capture the attention of watchers old and young. And it's kind of the thing that Miyazaki's kind of known for. It's almost kind of a Disney-like quality, to say the least. And it definitely lends credence to the reason he gets the nickname of the Japanese Disney, because of just the fact that uh, his animated works, they can be very deep and complex with messaging, but they can appeal to both audiences, young and old. There is a distinct difference with Miyazaki and Ghibli than there is with Disney. Disney, I think, markets and makes their movies with the intention of getting kids, but then having enough for the adults. I think with Ghibli and Miyazaki specifically is he makes it for adults, but there's enough for the kids. It is my take on the differences between the two because if you watch this movie or if you, someone tells you about this movie it's about witches and wizards okay kind of childlike but it's also about a young woman who turns old by a nasty spell that happens to her in the beginning of the movie and even though that sounds fantastical there is a, a certain type of gravitas that comes into it when, when you talk about that where someone has to engage with their mortality and if Disney were to do something like that, it would be much more comical. But in House Movie Castle, it's a little more serious, but it's not deadly serious. It is serious to a point where it takes the aspect of what's happening seriously enough to make it believable, but it doesn't overbear you with the emotions of the consequences of what's happening. There is tangibility, but there isn't an overt seriousness to it. I do kind of agree on the matter that um, it does definitely seem more that Miyazaki does kind of load his films more towards to be targeted towards adults with mm -hmm. just enough there for kids to kind of sit along for the ride. There's definitely that. But I think with Hell's Moving Castle, there's kind of enough whimsy and just uh, fantastical elements that it kind of balance, uh, plays the balancing act well between um, kids and adults. The thing with whimsy is that uh, with most people or most filmmakers try to incorporate whimsy in a movie, it turns into a catch-all to let the plot device go. Like Instead of explaining what's happening, it's just wave a wand and we fixed it. But this movie doesn't do that. It still feels whimsical without it being cheap or without it seeming a lacking of depth. Because when you think whimsy, I don't know what you think when you think of whimsy, but I think of Cinderella. I think of old Disney animated films, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, how uh, in order to uh, wake up Snow White, a guy has to kiss her. That's whimsical, but it's also a very, very shallow way of incorporating the end of the movie for a happy ending. Whereas this one, the whimsy is the fantasticness is there, but there's more depth to what's going on than just that it's all magic in this. And that's why I particularly love Miyazaki films and how he does his stories in, in these movies. We both watched this in Japanese, and I watched a little bit of it while we were talking 
of the English translation, and automatically I was like, oh man, I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> <It's> like, I, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't do that. I love Christian Bale, but he did not sound right as hell in, in this. But um, let, let's get into, I guess, the, the writing of the characters and everything. I liked Hal a lot in this movie because Hal, I believed him being very charming. Uh, but as the movie started going along, what a lot of these movies tend to do with people who are charmers and people who seem like, the, oh, they're the idealistic man or the beautiful man. All that, they try to incorporate depth as the movie goes on. But when they do that, it becomes harder and harder to identify with that person because he's just inherently charming. But the way they wrote the character of Hal specifically, I, I think was really well done because it seemed more and more believable as the time went on that this guy, as much as he portrays himself as somebody who is very charming and debonair and very magnetic, it, it goes to show exactly how damaged and broken he is to a certain extent. It made it really believable. And, and that's part of the thing that Hayao Miyazaki does really well with his characters. I'm thinking of uh, a Chihiro in Spirit of the Way. Like, he makes these characters to be one thing, but adds enough depth to make them much more than what it is and make them a fully realized character, which is not something that happens a lot in animated films. Hal sort of had the... He starts off kind of with the um, air of, like, the mysterious gentleman, especially when he ends up kind of... Uh, helping Sophie when uh, she's got two soldiers sort of kind of getting in her way um, of trying uh, trying to go where she needs to go and they're uh, they're trying to chat her up and stuff and they're just like like where are you going beautiful um come on just take some time out of your day sit and chat with us and he just kind of comes out of nowhere he's like oh uh, yeah she's with me um how about y'all piss off <laughs> yeah. that type of character also can come off bad if it's not written very well or it's not performed very well but in the japanese vocals in that it was done really well like i i thought the voices really fit well with the characters which is why when i switched it over to english i was really shocked by the decisions that the actors were making on that one because i was like that doesn't sound like how what the hell <laughs> so i, I was really surprised by how good the Japanese voices were on this as well. But as as you move through the movie and everything, Hal starts to show sort of the fact that he still is very much a child inside. Yeah. Um, especially just during one of the moments he has a major breakdown. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I guess more with the characters and everything. Uh, I really like Sophie in this. And this is a type of character that usually, in, in anime movies or any movies like this, the the main character tends to just be a springboard to all the fantastic characters that are in it, but there is a lot of sweetness and depth to this character, especially when she becomes older. And another, and with the writing specifically in this, I want to mention this. I really like the fact that this character didn't dwell so much on her fate, but then decided to stay on the course of how to fix this, because in most animated movies, especially when the actor the character is female. They tend to really go on a pity party and to be like, oh, I'm so, woe is me, I need help, all this curse, yada, yada, yada. And even though Sophie was not portrayed in the beginning as somebody who is steadfast or that type of person, I like how they developed her right away into some, from someone of action and not someone who needed help. And I think that was really important with this character and I think it really worked. Um, definitely agreed on Sophie. Just um, instead of the usual, just like helpless damsel, she just comes to term with um, the fact that she's been cursed with old age from from the witch of the waste and everything. Mm. It's kind of funny because I mean, like you said, just in some other movies, if you had a female character be thrown with that sort of a fate, it would just be just this giant pity party. It'd just be like, like, oh, woe is me. Everything's terrible. I've been cursed. By old age, it's the end. It, life is not worth living, and uh, the character would be desperately uh, trying to just hope for just some charming prince to somehow break the curse or whatever. Right. And uh, with Sophie's depiction in Hell's Moving Castle, she just kind of goes, "Well, this sucks. I'm cursed with old age, but you know what? All I can do is just keep moving on because." Um, there's not much that can be done other than to keep moving forward. 
and she's so charming in the old age too. And that was another thing I was worried about too, where uh, a lot of movies that do that, uh, I'm thinking of like Freaky Friday. I'm looking at other movies that do like the age swap where it's a 20 year old or a 10 year old and a 50 year old's body. They do the old thing of, oh, being old sucks. Oh my God, I'm so slow and I'm so wrinkly. And they don't dwell on it at all. She just says, oh, well, I got to do what I got to do. <laughs> just goes right into it. And I really do appreciate that. And then when it comes to the end of what happens between her and Howl, it doesn't feel as trite as it would in most of these types of movies. So it actually really fits because the character has enough depth for you to believe that she would actually have the fate that she has with the characters in this movie. That character was really important to get right. Because if this was just a wooden board who just so happened to be around the other characters, I, it probably would have been good, but it wouldn't be as good as it is right now. But I think Sophie is the linchpin of this movie that really ties everything together, all the fantastical elements that are in this movie. So I really enjoyed that character specifically. I, I know I uh, gave Hal a bunch of talk, but I, I, I have to state that Sophie, I think, is the best character in this movie. Yeah, she's very dynamic in her... Um, in her growth and everything, especially towards the end when she has to kind of realize that she too has a role to play, that while uh, initially she starts off kind of um, being at the mercy of, of her cursed fate, she does end up eventually realizing that even with her cursed fate, she has power as well too. Mm -hmm. This is a movie that I wish that I could convince little kids, specifically little girls, to watch this and enjoy it. But it's also too too long for, the for I guess, little kids like that. But I really think little girls would attach themselves to Sophie to a certain way where they would not only like the elements of it, but they would also like the character as well in this. So I, I really wish that more people would give this, more younger kids would give this a chance in this. But then again, I'm not a little girl, so I don't know exactly what it's like and what they think about. So, hey, what do I know? Animation. I mean, what else do we have to say about this? I mean, the, the animation's fantastic. Like, it's, it's beautiful. Is it as good as Spirited Away? I, I'm going to lean no, but it's still fantastic in this. I think only one other director has gotten better animation in hand-drawn animation than Miyazaki, and that's Mikado Shink Shinkai. But Shinkai's films are just not as good as Miyazaki. Just uh, Miyazaki's films are, are usually great. Uh, I want to say, I think, um, with Howl's Moving Castle that there was some new techniques being explored, so it's a little bit of an ex a technique exploration film as well, too. That might explain the reason why some people feel that the animation in this one wasn't as good as Spirited Away, which came before it. But I'm not the foremost expert on animation, so I can't definitively say so. <laughs> yeah. All we can say is, did it look good? And I'm going to say yes, it looked very good. I, I guess the, the is the moving castle CGI to a certain extent? I mean, I know that Spirited Away used a little bit of CGI in their sequences. I know that. Even so, like, uh, if you said, oh, it's not really a, a hand-drawn animation because you use CGI, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, I really don't give a shit. If it looks fantastic, I'm going to say so. That, that's that's all I care about. If it looks great, I'm going to be like, it looks fucking fantastic. Why would I care? <laughs> Is my, yeah. my uh, honest opinion on that. Well, that's it, really. We're going to get to spoilers and Howl's Moving Castle. If you have not seen it, you should uh, stop here and come back when you're ready. We are going to get to spoilers and Howl's Moving Castle in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Anyone who's not familiar with this movie do know it is actually based on a British novel by author Diana uh, Wynne-Jones. And uh, she wrote the novel Howl's Moving Castle back, back in 1986. Hmm. Nice. I think I read that somewhere, but I, I guess I kind of forgot about it. This is not the first time that Miyazaki. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I might be wrong, but I don't think this is the first time Miyazaki has used an English book to turn into a, an animated feature. I think he did that with The Wind Rises. I'm not entirely sure, or am I just thinking of Ghibli as a whole? As much as Ghibli is, is synonymous with Miyazaki, there are many other directors who work for Ghibli. So. I might be thinking of somebody else. 
Good to know. Thank you for that. There's there's a lot to dive into here. I want to say right off the rip, though. Is this an incredibly in-depth movie? No, but it doesn't need to be. It's still fantastic the way it is. So if you're expecting a like crazy in-depth movie to watch on this, eh, this is not it. That's not what this is. But I don't think it needs to be. And that's, I think, what adds to the whimsy of everything. Because you have enough depth in there for adults to sink their teeth into. But there's enough magic and things that you don't know about that it still feels fantastic in a way that's entertaining and enjoyable. That is like the hallmark of Miyazaki films, where it gives you enough depth to sink your teeth into, but enough to think about later, where you, you're trying to gauge, oh, is this like, uh, what this fantastic element here and there? Like, I, I can't get over with Miyazaki films, how much they have depth, but there's enough to make it feel magical. I think that's the, the, the word I'm looking for, is magical. It still feels magical without it feeling like it's for kids. And I that's why I, I adore Miyazaki films in this. Go. There is one part where just um, you've got Hal um, basically being ordered by the king to, to visit uh, the king and everything. And of course, Hal is just kind of completely cowering away and wanting to shirk the duty. He's just like, I just don't want to, I just don't want to go to war. Just make up an excuse. Just, um, hey, Sophie, I've got a bright idea. Just act like you're my mom. And then, you know, just uh, go and tell the king. Um, yeah, just um, Hal's a friggin' coward and he's he's a lazy bum. He doesn't want to go to war. Just don't don't have him do your bidding. It, yeah, he, he's an awful kid. And Funny enough, with a lot of Miyazaki's films, there are messages and themes behind them. Oh, yes. And this one apparently um, is very heavy in anti-war themes because apparently Miyazaki was very upset that the Iraq War was happening back in, I want to say, 2003. Mm -hmm. So this this movie was kind of his protest against the industrial war machine. And... It's kind of funny, too, because um, when he had released the movie, he was just like, uh, yeah, um, I know I am targeting a worldwide release, but this is probably going to bomb in the West. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't quite happen. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah, his films tend to have much deeper themes in all of his films. I think uh, Nausicaa of the Wind and Princess Mononoke is about environmentalism. I, I think I've heard that spirited away is about adolescence and my neighbor totoro is about death i think specifically but it's told in a much different way i I might be wrong on those but he definitely has a lot of added depth in those films that if you were to give it uh, another read you'd get more out of it when you watch the films god character wise what's the name of the the fire demon (laughs) calcifer Calcifer, thank you. Calcifer is an interesting character in this because this could have easily been a an, an annoying kind of comic relief character. I think in a Disney movie he would have been, but in this type of film, he's given a little more depth, not a lot of depth, but a little more depth than in, in most movies where he's the put upon type of caretaker in, in the place i think his character is pretty interesting and, and it turns out how to be uh, how important he is throughout the plot in this is there a specific character that i want to say i'm trying to remember his name markle yeah markle okay. markle um i think is is interesting because of course just while he is a kid he in the presence of uh, others in the world, he'll portray himself as like an old hermit and he'll wear a cloak that causes him to grow a beard and everything. Yeah. Just absolutely amusing kid. And even though he's a kid, he's he's got his moments where he's definitely more adult than Hal is. Yes. No, absolutely. Uh, he is an interesting character, too. Like, the, all the side characters are pretty interesting in this movie. Like, I, I can't think of one where I was actually kind of annoyed by him. Uh, and that really is the sign of really good writing. Even the Witch of the Waste, which kind of turned into a throwaway character towards the end of the movie. She was just there to a certain extent, which is an interesting twist because you're led to believe that she's going to be the villain throughout. But it kind of turns out not to be the case. 
the characters in this are really good. The, the, the main characters, I would say, which would be Sophie, Hal, Witch of the Waste, Markle, Halcifer. Yeah, that's it, really. That's, that's the only ones. And Turnip. Who, who can forget about Turnip? <laughs> this is really not a movie that I really want to spoil for people because I, I think explaining the movie will turn some people off because they're gonna think oh that sounds pretty silly that sounds pretty stupid I, I can't really say in words enough how the feel of the movie and the animation and how it moves and how it looks really adds to the sense of place that this movie has where in other movies let's say i'll use an example frozen frozen seems to be like a movie that is just set in this one place and nothing else is there it's just this one place Whereas Howl's Moving Castle, the worlds and areas that are in it, seems much more lived in and breathed in, and seems a lot more alive than in other animated films. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly here, or I'm explaining this well, but it just seems like the film is more alive than it would be in other animated films. Am I registering this well enough, or am I confusing you? What do you think? I think it uh, comes off. Um, the way that you're intending it to come off. The love story between Hal and Sophie. What did you think of it at the end? It was kind of cute. It wasn't like overly saccharine sweet or anything, but um, I think that's kind of something I appreciate mostly because just some, some other movies would have just kind of just been really cheesy and corny with it and just laid it on thicker than a pat of butter on some waffles. But this one was just nice and cute enough that it seemed it seemed fun uh, and it didn't seem like overly thick and just kind of smeared on to say, hey, did you know these two are very madly in love with each other? <laughs> yeah, but they weren't, though. I mean, uh, how I don't think even considered Sophie a romantic interest at all throughout the film and it wasn't until the part where he sent her to that uh, that house that he lived in as a kid with the beautiful landscape and everything is where it kind of was like, oh yeah, he does have feelings for her. Which it felt kind of weird in a way because I, I first when she exclaimed that he, that she was in love with him, I was like, where did that come from? Like that, I didn't really have that sense that that was happening. I, I did get the sense that he was amazed, she was amazed by him, but he, she was also kind of annoyed by him too, to a certain extent. I never oh, yeah. But I never got the sense that she was madly in love with him until she said it. So when it happened, I was like, eh, really? Well, in the beginning, it's kind of inferred that that, that she's that she's kind of infatuated with him because of the little meeting in the alleyway that happened. Sure. And her mom uh, kind of uh, hints and says, oh, yeah, Hal, he's he's kind of a weird one, you know, just uh, he's just strange and he's out there. And it just kind of sets it up. Uh, where Sophie sort of has a bit of an infatuation with him going, okay, well, yeah, I think he's neat. <laughs> yeah. Infatuation's one thing. Like, if you're, like, really curious about somebody and going, oh, who's that, t who's that tall, dark stranger? And along those lines. Like, I get that to a certain extent. But by halfway through the movie, she is saying he's in, she's in love with him. And at no point was I like, but why? Like, why is that? I get why you like that. I, I, because you're right. A lot of movies of this ten sense tend to get overly dramatic about it. They, they start to have the googly eyes. They start to flirt. They start to say all these funny, quippy things. And it just becomes more and more obvious that they are in love. But in this movie, I, I think I needed a little bit more to be like, are they in love? I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I don't know how else to say other than I, I kind of didn't buy the romance. Uh, not until, like, towards the end, where the character development of Howl is basically what he said was, I found something that I want to die for, and it's you. And then I bought that instantly. It's like, yep, okay, got it. And I think that was the, the, the click I needed, because uh, throughout the film, he was portrayed as someone who was pretty self-centered and only cared about himself. But around after that scene happened, then I was like, oh, okay. I get it now. Now I see what's going on in that. I, I think the romance could have had a little more time in it because when it was exclaimed that Sophie was in love with him, I was like, that's, I don't know about that. But 
when it came to then it being cemented that they both love each other, that's when I bought it. I was like, okay, cool. Got it. I, I think it just needed a little work, but uh, not enough where I would really want to knock it too much. I'll say one thing in this. We're not going to spoil much of the movie, but if you like animated films, watch it. It's so good. It is a really good movie. This felt like, to me, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Iron Giant, but it had a feel of that way with me, and I... I really love the iron. Final thoughts. I will start first. Again, favorite Japanese director is Hayao Miyazaki. Favorite anime director is Hayao Miyazaki. He's he's an excellent director, and I love his films. Even the films that I'm like, and eh, with like Princess Mononoke, I can definitely see a quality that he has in his films that other anime films just don't come close to replicating. And it's gonna be really sad when he's no longer making movies. In this movie, I really enjoyed it. Is it as good as Spirited Away? No, but nothing else. I don't think anything will ever come close to Spirited Away. So that's not even not even a fair thing to say in regards to this movie. But I liked the characters. I really liked the story. It, it wasn't too long. And I actually really grow to like Sophie a lot in this movie. And that's usually a character in these types of movies that tend to be half-baked. But because she was a fully realized character, it really helped me envelope myself and really get into the movie more than I would have others. I'd give this four out of five stars. And I, I don't give that kind of rating to a movie I've seen the first time uh, a lot. But this is actually a really good movie. And if it weren't for the fact that I think Spirit Away is, one, is the best animated movie of all time, I think this would be Miyazaki's best film. But it's four stars for me. An excellent movie. If you are into this type of movie, if you're into animated films, you need to watch it. Four stars for me. For me, this is probably going to be right at the 90% mark. Um, mostly because just it's just fun. It doesn't uh, kind of belittle uh, your intelligence in a way that some animated films can kind of dumb things down just to just to make sure it appeals to kids or whatever. It's got some very interesting literary themes intertwined with it, and overall, I just think it uh, it's just a great movie overall. And, and you said one key thing there that uh, I 100% agree with, and I want to point out, is that it, it doesn't demean your intelligence. It goes in thinking that you can handle the themes and everything that's going on in the movie without us holding your hand. And I love the fact that Miyazaki does this. He does it with every movie he does. He respects the intelligence of the person who's watching. And if you can't handle that type of stuff, it's still good. It's still a beautiful movie that is exciting and has those elements, but it definitely respects the intelligence of someone who is watching this, no matter how old or what their intelligence is. So I, I agree with you there, and I, I love that about Miyazaki films. 90%, man. For a movie that we really like, it, it, I guess it's kind of disappointing we don't want to talk more spoilers on this, but I guess the thing that we want to say is basically see the movie. It's fantastic, and it's on Max right now, formerly HBO Max. Oh, God, I, I really hate that name. <laughs> God, I'm going to Max. God, what was wrong with HBO Max? Zero, tell me what was wrong with it. No idea. Just um, the people who uh, I think I think they gave um control of HBO Max over to the guy who's running Discovery Plus. Yes, and so he's using Discovery Plus logic on it. I'm just like, oh God, no, no, why, why did you do this? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, four stars for me, ninety percent for zero.